Hello, and welcome to my digital kitchen. We're going to break down Tetris and build this simplified version using a few hundred lines of code. As a game, it's very bare bones, but it can teach us a lot. Let's revisit Tetris today on Cooking Up Code. This project is simple enough to approach straight on. You could declare a 10 by 20 array and start putting values into it, then write the code to move blocks down, left, right, rotate, and go from there. YouTube Your Coffee Break wrote Tetris from scratch this way, and it's great fun. You should watch it. Link is in the description. But I want to use Tetris to explore the most important concept in all of programming, especially graphics programming. Our recipe today is layering three different ways. Let's get started. The secret to software is creating manageable complexity through layering. Everything we do with computers requires a foundation of other software systems. From the math libraries and hardware drivers to the language features themselves. The reason we don't code with ones and zeros anymore is because of layer upon layer of time-tested abstractions that let us approach problems using higher level concepts. That's why a collection of software is called a stack. Our own programs are no different. In fact, you can't really avoid layering. Everyone builds on top of libraries that provide the base layers for their own work. This project uses SFML, the Simple Fast Media Library. The library makes it easy to write cross-platform code by providing simple abstractions on top of complex functionality. And SFML is itself a layer on top of other open source libraries. Another reason to build in layers is what I'm about to do, plagiarize my own code. In fact, about one-third of the total code in this project is copy-pasted from previous projects. I didn't plan for the code to be used for Tetris when I first wrote it, but by creating software components as layers, sometimes they can be pulled out of the pantry and repurposed. Here's what I borrowed for myself. A few simple functions, including one to rotate a 2D vector by 90 degrees, the square struct, representing a square or cell on a game board, like a position but using signed integers and supporting addition and subtraction, Yes, basically just a 2D vector. It has two related types. Grid is just a width and height, representing a rectangular region of squares. Squares can be tested to see if they're contained in the grid, and a given square can be converted to an index. This is used by the field template object, which just stores some value into each square in the grid. Next is our first genuine class, the game interface. This class encapsulates the logic for running an SFML window but allowing the subclass to customize it. It should look familiar. It's basically this SFML sample code with the task-specific parts replaced with virtual functions. Finally, a random number generator. The original code contained many other methods, but I trimmed it down to just what was needed for this project. Some of you may be puzzled why all this code is in header files. The normal practice for C++ is to write the structures and entry points in the header but implement the code bodies in a separate C++ file. In fact, sometimes C++ won't compile unless you divide your code up like that, which is just dumb. It requires me to specify the function signature twice, once in the header, and once in the code body, and in slightly different forms. If I need to add or change arguments, I have to do it in two places. It's not difficult, but it's a pointless chore and can potentially cause bugs. Modern languages don't work this way. Take a look at C Sharp, Java, Swift. All of those allow you to define the function body and call signature in the same place. There's no headers, or if there are, they're hidden from the programmer. C++ is just old. It's a super old language that's derived from an even older ancestral language that predates modern operating systems. That's a downside of building software in layers. Sometimes we get stuck with old stuff. Fortunately, the more modern variants of C++ allow class methods in headers to have bodies. I organize my code this way whenever possible. My time is valuable. If the compiler has to work harder, I don't care. Before we write any Tetris code, we should analyze what happens in the game. The board is a grid of squares, and each square could be empty or contain an image of a colored block. The tetramino is a set of four blocks that move as a unit, left, right, and down, as well as rotate, 
their movement constrained to the empty region of the board. Once the tetramino can no longer move down, it merges with the rest of the debris at the bottom of the board. The tetramino loses its identity, dissolving into independent blocks that erode away in the line clearing process. Using a traditional array for the board would mix the different block behaviors, which we would like to keep separate. What's called for here is layering. Layering of the system state. In computer graphics, it's sometimes called compositing. We're going to break the board down into layers by defining an abstract class that computes an int for every square. Zero means empty. By making the grid lookup into a virtual function, we can create specific layers with different purposes. The first layer is the boundary and just returns a non-zero value outside the visible region of the grid. I use minus one, but the value doesn't matter. There's no border at the top, so the tetraminos can rain down unimpeded. The next layer type is storage, which holds the debris left over from falling blocks and consists mainly of a field of ints. Uh, it clears lines by finding contiguous lines and then removes them by shifting everything above those lines down. The next layer is the tetramino itself, which we'll treat as individual square positions. I call it a glob. It contains an offset for the whole glob, the four squares relative to that offset, and a color number. The value function returns the color if the input square matches the absolute position of any of the blocks. The class also implements the logic for the glob. It can test for collisions against a layer, either at its current position or after adding a speculative offset. The slam down method moves it down as far as possible before colliding with the layer, and the stamp method copies its blocks into the storage layer when it dies. For rotation, there's also a floating point pivot offset, allowing the glob to rotate around non-grid aligned centers. Initialization sets the starting square positions and pivot point for any of the seven tetramino shapes. We just need one final layer class, which allows composing the others together. We keep pointers to the sublayers in the list and return any non-zero value at a given square. Game logic is the job of the logic class. It manages the state of the board and the actions that can alter it, but remains separate from any input processing, graphics, or animation. Logic contains our three main layers, boundary, storage, and glob, plus two compositions. The background composition is boundary plus storage, anything that a moving glob might collide with, while the display composition is storage plus glob, the state of the visible blocks. Moving the glob sideways or down checks for a collision against the composed background and only allows the move if none occurs. If moving down results in a collision, then the glob is stamped into storage and a new tetramino is spawned. This also triggers the line clearing check. Rotation is a bit trickier. The tetramino will rotate only if there's space while also avoiding walls. We start by doing the rotation. If we don't hit any debris in the storage layer, then we allow the glob to move so it no longer hits the border, called the kick. And if all that works and there are still no collisions, we keep it. If anything fails, we undo the whole rotation. That's it. The game logic is terribly simple. The game itself is an instance of game interface, so it just needs drawing and interaction methods. Drawing should be simple, but I admit it took a couple of tries. I wanted to use the rectangle primitive with border, drawing them in order where the space has a block. But it looks bad. Bits of the new blocks erase parts of the old blocks. It makes the lines irregular and they don't line up. The solution is one of the oldest tricks in computer graphics, drawing in layers, also called drawing in passes. Draw the background layers first, then when you draw the foreground, it only writes over the background. Our draw pass function takes the field to draw and a block pass object that draws a block. The first pass uses a special block pass object which sets the color based on index. The second pass uses a block pass object configured to draw the outlines. The result is much tidier. Finally, keys get interpreted directly into events on the game logic and time updates come as delta time intervals since the last update. We subtract each interval from the fall time counter and move the tetramino down one when the time resets. 
The result is a recognizable, mostly functioning Tetris. There are a bunch of small improvements we can make. Let's start by adding a ghost image of the Tetramino in its dropped position. The structure of the code so far makes the ghosts come together with hardly anything new. We just have to add a new glob object called ghost, create an update ghost function which copies the state of the main glob to the ghost, then call slam down on the ghost to move it all the way down. Insert calls to update ghost anytime the main glob changes. Drawing the ghost adds another pass to the draw method which draws borderless blocks in the ghost color. The ghost pass goes first so the ghost image never draws over any of the real blocks. Since lines get cleared by the storage layer, that code can also update the score and drop interval. Arguably, this might be better as part of the game logic, but the distinction is trivial. Checking for game over just means looking to see if the top line of the storage layer contains any debris, and we already have a function for that. When that happens, we reset the game by allocating a new game logic object. If you were wondering why the game logic object was a shared pointer, this is why. Clearly, there's more that can be done, like display the score in any useful way, but this project does what we need. It illustrates layering three ways, layering of software abstractions, layering of system states, and 2.5D layering of graphic elements. Thanks for watching. See you next time on Cooking Up Code.